I'm Amy Tendrich. I am a patient advocate and a journalist, and I run a site called Diabetes Mind, which is a uh, information resource and kind of networking destination for people whose lives are affected by diabetes. Um, I also host my own series of innovation technology events. I've uh, been doing that since 2011. Um, in part here at Stanford, we've done them at UCSF, and also at different, uh, in different cities now in June in association with the big ADA conference. So um, I got started in all of this when I was diagnosed myself with type 1 diabetes as an adult in um, 2003. And I have to say, at the time, there was a lot of buzz about the cure. And I, lot, I met a lot of people who were told there would be a cure by the year 2000. So <laughs> I missed it by a few years, unfortunately. But um, from a patient perspective, I have to say that you know, there's the, the progress on the cure front had, feels like it's been close to zero. But we know that there is a lot of work going on, and we're very privileged to have one of our panelists here today who is on that path. Um, but meanwhile, obviously, there's been a huge focus on creating technologies and tools to help us thrive in the day to day and live better. Um, and the technology is really exploding. So I, I know we just asked how many people here are do-it-yourselfers. Do we have, uh, how many people here are like, feel, consider themselves quite diabetes savvy? Okay, a few, but so it's a mix, it's a mix. So before we dive in, I wanted to just cover a couple of basics to make sure we're all on the same page. Okay, so type one, the kind of diabetes where your pancreas stops making insulin and you basically are on sort of manual transmission as opposed to automatic. That's what we like to say. So it, you, you're constantly in danger of having your glucose go too high, which can um, cause long-term effects, but can also land you in the hospital with a coma and kill you. Um, if it goes dangerously low, you can have a seizure, land in the hospital, it can kill you. So it's a very severe onset, and um, it's something that you can't ignore. You know pretty much right away if you have it. Um, type 2, on the other hand, is the type that most people have, much bigger uh, uh, group of people have. It's where your pancreas still makes insulin, but your body cannot uh, process it properly. So it, that type can be controlled with diet, uh, with lifestyle, so diet and exercise, and also oral medications, at least for um, a number of years. So for people with type 1, like myself, there are basically two things that we need, two tasks that we constantly need to do and that we need devices or tools for. And that is to monitor our blood sugar very regularly, and we need some way to get the insulin into our body. So we need um, a delivery mechanism. So um, just that, I want to keep that in mind as we go through these technologies today. So this is a quick look back, a snapshot of what things looked like um, in the year 2005 when I had just started Diabetes Mine. And what you're looking at there in the corner are two glucose meters and an insulin pump. And you can see they're still pretty clunky and hospital-ish. They don't look very customizable. Um, they're getting a little more main, uh, streamlined, a little smaller, but they certainly aren't connected or, um, you know, in any way. And this uh, picture in the lower uh, corner here is what it looked like in the doctor's office when you go in and you want to get the data off of these devices. So unfortunately, it still looks like that some places, but we're getting there. And you know, now we have this incredible expanding toolbox, obviously, and this is uh, some snapshots of me taking advantage of all these amazing tools that we have now. So in the middle there is me with my um, tubeless insulin pump, uh, the Insulet uh, Omnipod, and it allows me to wear an insulin pump without having to wear this long plastic cannula hanging off my body like most people have to wear if they want to use a pump. Um, the other one is, um, I know what you're thinking, but I'm not taking a hit off a pipe there. That is me <laughs> using a, uh, the new, newest uh, in insulin on the market, inhalable insulin called Afresia. It's been out for a couple of years, and it's been a real game changer for many people because it kind of gets in and out of your system very quickly, therefore like mimicking uh, uh, the re a real healthy pancreas um, better. And then, um, last not least, in the corner there, that is me wearing um, a, a device that I th hope some of you got to take a look at just now in the, um, the networking reception. This is the newest continuous glucose monitor from Sensionics that is just FDA approved a couple months ago. It's the very first um, implantable CGM device, so it's a sensor implanted in your arm and you wear this transmitter over it. And as you can see, it's connected and completely controlled by a smartphone. So I just want to take a minute also to remind you that diabetes is not a small problem, it's a huge problem. 
The, uh, there are currently about 30 million people in this country who are diagnosed with diabetes and many millions more who supposedly do not know that they have it yet. yet. So we're talking about both types of diabetes um, plus pre-diabetes in that case. Um, and it is costing our country a ton of money, uh, $327 billion annually um, in healthcare costs, which is bigger than the GDP of Pakistan. Um, so there's huge market opportunities here. And tonight we're going to focus mainly on uh, technology for type 1, but I do want to make sure that we are clear that these uh, advances often trickle down and there is still a lot of crossover between uh, the type 1 technologies and things that can help people with type 2. So what's really fueled um, the recent explosion in innovation is these continuous sensors, the continuous glucose monitors. Um, they have uh, become much more accurate. They allow people, obviously, to see their glucose in real time, to see trends, um, and to get alerts when they're going high or low. So real, real way to change someone's life. And they are getting, again, more, more accurate and also smaller, more kind of consumer friendly, if you will. I mean, no one really enjoys wearing a, a medical device on their body all the time, but you can see here, this, uh, the, this is the, um, the Abbott sensor here. It's just a little disc, so it's, it's a lot easier to be discreet with these than it ever was before. Um, but while we're talking about sort of the notion of uh, real progress or more of the same, there is one thing that I want to call out that is neither a breakthrough nor status quo. And that is the cost and access issue. We are actually in the midst of a catastrophe in our country. Um, there is an insulin pricing crisis happening right now. Um, the cost of this life-saving or life-sustaining medication has tripled since 2002. And there are people out there who are literally dying because they can't get access to insulin and they're having to ration it. This is interesting, uh, this story, because I was actually contacted by the um, senior medical correspondent from CNN a couple of weeks ago, wanting to do a story about this, um, asking us to help source it and find people. And so this shows a bit the power of social media in today's world. We put out one tweet, and within an hour, we had more than 25 people who were not only willing to go on national TV, but were really like champing at the bit to be chosen, actually, to be part of the story, because they want to share the struggle that they're going through. So. You know, I just want to point out that, you know, ironically, while people are struggling to get the very basics that they need to live with diabetes, you know, at the same time, we're having billions of dollars being invested in di diabetes digital health. So what that means is that there's a plethora of, you know, new, ever more consumer-friendly tools for us to use, which is great if we are able to access them. But it does create a bit of a haves and have-nots situation. So I just want to say that access is something we should definitely keep in mind as we talk about innovation and as we continue to encourage innovation. And a lot of these innovations that we're going to talk about are things that are discussed at these um, forums that I was mentioning that I've been um, organizing since 2011. Uh, what we do, again, is try to bring together all of the groups, so take the, you know, gather up people in this sort of do-it-yourself movement, um, these patient entrepreneurs, alongside established industry and regulators and clinicians and UI designers and um, people who are um, just innovating on um, general health apps because they're also part of this world. And really, it's become kind of a hub of this counterculture of people who are pushing for open access to data and devices um, to enable better care. And this hashtag, by the way, if you haven't heard it before, We Are Not Waiting, which came out of these events, has now become a national and even kind of an international moniker for um, patient-led innovation. Um, not only in diabetes, it's being used outside of that as well, so pretty exciting. And this has actually gone really big. So this is uh, my co-organizer, Howard Look. He is the um, CEO of the Palo Alto-based um, diabetes data startup called Tidepool, and he received a Health Changemaker Award at the White House a couple of years ago for the pioneering work that is being done in data-driven diabetes care. And all of this has actually helped us to get some significant PR around this issue, around the need for better designed um, tools for chronic disease care. And in turn, it has also helped the patient community really put pressure on the established and kind of legacy pharma and med tech uh, companies to pay closer attention to real patient needs in real life and to innovate alongside patients. 
So this story, for example, this just appeared last week in the New York Times. Um, this gentleman is Jeff Dotches. He is the former founder of Razorfish, which is the world's leading global digital marketing company. He was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes himself a couple of years ago and just realized there has to be a better way. So he has now founded a company called OneDrop, which is sort of remaking the glucose testing experience and really taking full advantage of the Internet of Things. Um, they redesigned the products and are also kind of combining uh, real-time coaching with um, all of these app tools. So he it kind of represents this new breed of entrepreneurs who um, have lived experience with the illness that they're innovating for and who are also consumer technology savvy. Okay, and um, with that, that brings us to a look at kind of the landscape and the, some of the items we'll be discussing tonight. So there are breakthroughs kind of happening in four major areas. Uh, I talked about con the continuous sensors, which give patients this real-time awareness. They are now being combined with these advanced um, insulin delivery products uh, to give us automated systems. So what we're calling uh, AID, or automated insulin delivery also known as closed loop or artificial pancreas. Um, and there is, this is a huge area of development right now and speculation as well. Um, there are also, there's also a category I would call care platforms. So that kind of covers uh, OneDrop, which I just mentioned, which is companies that are combining tracking tools with other app features and also uh, pairing that with coaching from real life experts. And this area is particularly useful for people with type 2, although there are many people with type 1 who are taking advantage of these systems as well. Um, and then, again, last not least, but cell therapies, um, which are still experimental, but are definitely making major progress. And I'm very happy that we have a premier expert in the house tonight to talk to us about that. So with that, I would like to invite my panelists to introduce themselves. Hello everyone, my name is Divya Gopasetti and I am coming from the Diatribe Foundation. Um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about a design challenge that I co-created last year while at Stanford and then dive into some of my work at the Diatribe Foundation. Um, so Disrupt Diabetes was the name of our design challenge and it was founded upon this idea that the people who are most affected by diabetes are the most effective in innovation. So we started out by selecting 13 patients from across the United States who were excited about innovation, and then we matched them with a student from Stanford as well as a professional designer. Together, those teams worked together to uncover an unmet need in diabetes and then do in-depth user research for about three months. Then they came together in person at Stanford and their teams were joined by medical experts and leaders in the healthcare industry and they spent an entire day working to design solutions to the needs that they honed in on. And beyond the solutions themselves, which were amazing, we were so happy to show patients that their voice was more than a checkbox in innovation. That patient leadership really could have an impact from everything from the need finding stage all the way through the solution development. And this was empowering for every stakeholder involved, not just the patients. Um, at the Diatribe Foundation, my work is all about empowering people with diabetes with information. So we send out a weekly newsletter that goes out to about 200,000 people with diabetes and caregivers. Our primary goal is to synthesize the latest news in diabetes technology and science to these people who it's affecting the most. Um, and we have two really core tenets that we focus in when we write our articles. One is how do we get people to increase their time in a healthy glucose range? And two, how do we decrease the cognitive and emotional burden that people with diabetes have to face? And as a, an associate at the Diatribe Foundation, I have the opportunity to watch the industry at large because I'm not responsible for any one particular product or service. And really, that enables me to assess the biggest patient gaps. One thing that's really striking to me is the incidence of type 1 and type 2 diabetes is increasing, but the number of diabetes specialists and endocrinologists is decreasing. And this necessitates a transfer of responsibility from healthcare providers to things like machine learning and algorithms. So it's really exciting to me that there's so much energy in this room around investing in diabetes um, because I think there's a lot of room for impact. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Joel Goldsmith. Uh, I'm the Senior Director of Digital Platforms at Abbott Diabetes Care. 
And uh, before I get started, I just want to tell uh, a quick little anecdote about how Amy and I got to know each other uh, because it relates to Stanford. Uh, I did a fellowship here through the biodesign program a little bit more than 10 years ago. And around that time, Amy was starting her blog. She uh, wrote a, 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 an open letter to Steve Jobs. This was at a time when he was still alive essentially asking for the design principles that had been proven in the consumer electronics world and really embodied by Apple to be applied to life-enhancing or life-sustaining medical devices. And, and it really crystallized for me what I wanted to do with my career. So I reached out to Amy and we forged a friendship and we've been in touch ever since. Shortly after that fellowship, I, I joined Abbott, and uh, it's been a, a wonderful journey. Uh, I've gotten the chance to, to be the product lead on uh, a product called Freestyle Libre, which has really disrupted glucose monitoring. Uh, so in the span of roughly four years, uh, it's now being used by over 1.3 million people across 46 countries. Uh, and the way that it works, for those of you that, that aren't familiar with sensor-based glucose monitoring, you saw a picture uh, on the slide. It's a, a small disposable sensor that's worn on the back of the upper arm for up to 14 consecutive days. And, and to retrieve data from that sensor, you, you can use either a proprietary device we call the reader, or more recently, we've introduced mobile apps for the iPhone and Android, so you can use your phone to directly scan that sensor. And, in a, uh, and you do that by holding it in close proximity to the, to the sensor. And in a fraction of a second, you get three pieces of information out of it. You get your current glucose as of that moment in time. You get up to eight hours of glucose history that's uh, depicted in a, in a graph and you get a trend arrow that shows you how your glucose is changing, if it's rising or falling, and, and how quickly it's doing that. And it's those three pieces of information in combination that provide context about where one's glucose was, is, and is likely to go. So I think the, the reason that Freestyle Libre has been so successful in such a short span of time uh, is really the, the combination of the, the usability that it offers, or the delightful user experience, uh, the fact that it makes it effortless to capture dense glucose data, and then it visualizes that data in a format that is actionable by mere mortals, uh, coupled with the fact that it's a much more affordable option to uh, traditional forms of continuous glucose monitoring. And, and the true testament of that is the fact that it is now available for use in 46 countries. It's reimbursed either fully or partially in 33 of those countries. And, and we're talking about a span of time, four years, where that is uh, very uncommon in this category, almost unprecedented. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the reasons we've been able to achieve that, that level uh, of, of market access and coverage is because of the real world evidence that we've been able to generate. Uh, and that takes me to sort of my, my current state. About two years ago, uh, I, I took over a, a new group that's uh, called Digital Platforms and is really focused on the software-based products and services that surround the core Freestyle Libre platform uh, and enable uh, mobile medical apps to become the primary user interface and cloud-based services to really enable advanced forms of clinical decision support. Pleasure to be here tonight. So hello, I'm Eugene Brandon. I'm a Senior Director of Strategic Relations at Biocide. I've been at Biocite for uh, just over 13 years now. So I've followed, um, have been a part of that path at Biocite uh, for quite some time. And uh, what we're talking about at Biocite is a little bit different from the devices and the uh, technologies uh, that you're used to with CGMs and, and so forth. Uh, we're talking about uh, living therapy. So this is cell therapy and dare I say, uh, a functional cure. So what, what do we mean by a functional cure? What we're talking about is something where you can receive the treatment, put it in, take it, uh, however it may be, and then you can forget about it. So 
As we all know, uh, 100 years ago, insulin changed type 1 diabetes from a fatal disease, from a death sentence, to what we might call a life sentence or a chronic disease. So with the functional cure, we hope to have something that will allow you to no longer need to take the insulin and no longer need to check your blood glucose. So that sounds very good. Uh, what There actually is a currently a functional cure that exists as a proof of concept. It's islet transplant. So perhaps someone in here, there's many people with type 1 here, perhaps somebody in here has had an islet transplant or knows someone that's had an islet transplant. An islet transplant is sourced from those uh, very kind people who when they pass away, they donate their organs, pancreas is, is uh, harvested and the islets are prepared. And this technology has been developed over the last 20 to 30 years. And those people who've received an islet transplant have been functionally cured. So there are people now who've received islets under the Edmonton protocol uh, going on 20 years of insulin independence. I've met a few people with, with islet transplants and they are <coughs> very pleased with, with how that's gone. Uh, so one, what is the issue with the islet transplant? Why, why don't all type ones have an islet transplant? Well, one of the main issues is the supply issue. There's approximately uh, 2,000 pancreases donated a year in the United States, and there's over a million people with type 1 diabetes. So that's one of the issues. Another issue is the requirement to take immunosuppression. So um, immunosuppression, it's not the end of the world. Those who've had islet transplants that I've talked with said, I will gladly trade what I was dealing with before for having to take a bunch of pills each day. Um, so. We're going to deal with this uh, in, a, in several ways, and hopefully I'll be able to tell you about it. Uh, first of all, let's deal with the supply issue. So in 1998, for the first time in history, human embryonic stem cells were described. And what we know about pluripotent stem cells, and, and Viacide has worked extensively with pluripotent stem cells and developing the methods that are required in order to actually uh, test in the clinic and then commercialize such a product. Pluripotent stem cells, and just to be clear, I'm not talking about stem cell clinics or stem cell therapy, that's a different thing. We use pluripotent stem cells as a starting material to make our product. So pluripotent stem cells have two remarkable properties. What's very well known is that pluripotent stem cells can become any cell in the body, provided you can figure out the recipe, so to speak, of how to make a cell type from pluripotent stem cells. And that's what Viacite spent a good 10 years or so with a very concerted effort. It was very remarkable to, to be part of and to watch to figure out how to make pancreas from pluripotent stem cells. The second remarkable property of pluripotent stem cells is that you can make as many of them as you need. And that's the key for the supply issue. So we figured out how to make beta cells. We have now the methods to manufacture as much biomass or embryonic stem cell or pluripotent stem cell material as we need, we can make those and we should be able to address the supply issue. Now we have these, what we call pancreatic endoderm cells that are implanted. They're implanted under the skin. We have um, three different versions of how we're delivering these cells that I will talk about, each one dealing with the immune system slightly differently. And we're in clinical trials with two of those products. And we hope that we will be able to say something positive uh, in the not too distant future. You know, I, those of you who have been dealing with this for a long time, I completely am as sympathetic as I can be that, that this has been a long road and, and people have said cure since long before 2000. And uh, the cure is always five years away. The cure is always five years away. Um, I'm not going to give a date right now, but I'm just going to say I hope that we're much closer than we were in 2000, and I know we are much closer than we were in 2000. So, so I think there's a lot of exciting work going on in this space, and I'm excited to tell you more about it. Thank you. So my name is Jeffrey Brewer. I'm the CEO of Bigfoot Biomedical. I became interested in uh, diabetes, and specifically in the drug insulin, uh, which was life-giving uh, for my son, who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 2002. Uh, I was uh, glad to have this drug, because otherwise he would be dead uh, uh, without it, as was mentioned earlier. The problem is it's also a dangerous drug to use on a daily basis. Uh, 
I was appalled uh, as a parent for my son, uh, Sean, seven years old at the time, uh, to be responsible for using this drug and to be given tools that consisted of some needles, some vials of insulin, and a uh, blood glucometer, and literally a sliding scale hand-drawn that said, if glucose is this, do that. If it's that, do this. And uh, I was appalled that uh, technology had not been brought to bear against this problem to help people to take this very dangerous but life-giving drug. Uh, and this, where my son was diagnosed, was in the best place he could go in New York City, uh, Nomi Berry uh, Diabetes Center. Uh, by the way, most people still take insulin like that. That's the tools they're working with. Uh, I said it was unacceptable. I began a journey, which has led me here today. Uh, I learned about a thing called an artificial pancreas, which had been tested on dogs up at that point. Uh, uh, basically, an insulin pump infusing insulin, a continuous glucose monitor, and some sort of feedback loop in between the two to regulate the delivery of insulin. Uh, I started inquiring as to when this was going to be commercialized. What were the opportunities for me to be able to access such a thing for my son? I found out it wasn't happening anytime soon in 2002. Uh, the research hadn't been done on humans. Uh, the FDA uh, didn't have any way to even uh, think about a device which would give a drug which, if given in the wrong amount, would kill a person. Uh, there was a lot of clinical inertia in terms of using the tools, and that continues through to today. But still, I said, there's got to be an opportunity here. So I went and found like-minded uh, people. I started a program at the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, which had been focused on a cure up until that point, uh, called the Artificial Pancreas Project. Uh, put some skin in the game uh, myself, based on uh, uh, some of the success I'd been able to be fortunate to have early in life, and then found a bunch of other people who believe the same, that. Uh, treatments and the improvement of those treatments was an important part of JDRF's mission. We went and found the best researchers around the world who were interested in devices and data and how to actually use that on behalf of patients. One of them is actually standing over there, Dr. Bruce Buckingham, who's one of the uh, leading lights. <laughs> In 2003, 2004, he, he was literally uh, the only game in town uh, doing device research, uh, as, as silly as that seems, that uh, uh, frequent, that, that uh, recent ago. But uh, I found Bruce, I found a lot of other folks, we put them together in a consortium of sites that then actually took insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitors, all the pumps, all the sensors, a bunch of different algorithms and tested them on people, first in an inpatient setting here at Stanford, then in an outpatient setting. Uh, we'd done that by 2007, and actually it uh, showed that the computer was better at doing it than most people did it for themselves. But still, uh, in 2007, there wasn't a path through to the marketplace. So I uh, worked with JDRF. By that point, I actually had the opportunity to become the CEO of that organization. I guess I spent so much time with them, they said, why don't you just run the place? <laughs> Uh, one of my major initiatives was to try and work with the FDA to uh, sit down with them and have them understand how badly people were doing with this disease today and how dangerous insulin was and how these devices could help make it a lot less dangerous. They couldn't solve all the problems. They couldn't protect people at all costs, but they could make it better. Fewer people would suffer. Fewer people would end up in the hospital. Fewer people would die from insulin dosing errors. We were successful at doing that and actually created a regulatory pathway that now a number of companies are exploiting the uh, only ex devices that exist on the market. Uh, the Medtronic 670G uh, exist uh, and are approved as a result of the work that JDRF did. Uh, one of the things that I also was very excited about at JDRF that didn't work out so well was to directly partner with these medical device companies and to subsidize some of the research that uh, they said they wouldn't otherwise do the development efforts that they needed to do in order to develop smarter, more usable, uh, connected, secure systems. And frankly, those projects uh, didn't eventuate in anything that people are using today. Uh, and along the way, uh, I was blown away by my co-founder at Bigfoot Biomedical, who was actually the first person to create a DIY system, uh, an automated insulin delivery system. He hacked into a Medtronic. Uh, insulin pump, a Dexcom continuous glucose monitor, uh, used his uh, 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 analytical and computer science skills as an automated trader on Wall Street to develop algorithms that read glucose values and actually translated those into insulin doses. 
He tested this first on his wife, who'd had type 1 diabetes for 25 years, a Harvard-trained pediatrician, and they developed a system that then they put on their son, who had been diagnosed a couple years before with type 1 diabetes. That's 2012. And, and that system that he created, uh, in which now thousands of people have copied and are doing it as DIY project themselves, um, those systems are way far ahead of anything being done in industry. They're more usable, they're more connected, they're more secure uh, than anything on any other uh, company's drawing board, I will say, with the exception of Bigfoot Biomedical. Because <laughs> we, we, we are the hackers, we are the people who, uh, who decided it wasn't good enough and we weren't waiting. Actually, our chief engineer was the first person to say we are yes. not waiting, Lane Desborough. Um, they uh, 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 have uh, provided us uh, with an opportunity to leverage technology that exists, much of which is used in other aspects of the economy quite successfully. Data science and cybersecurity, uh, enterprise systems, uh, usability in the real world, industrial design for uh, people who are not paying attention, who don't read manuals, who don't listen to their doctor, pretty much all of us. Uh, that kind of level of design for safety and usability, uh, that's what's required to solve this problem. Uh, not devices uh, uh, that people have to learn uh, over a course of two hours from a certified diabetes educator and then have a manual that they reference at home. Uh, they need something that just works and is simple and that's what we're doing at Bigfoot. Uh, trying to take all the best of what technology can offer today, take the specific expertise we have in understanding the disease and how people live it and how people struggle with it. Try to understand the clinicians who treat those patients who are as burdened as the patients themselves in order to provide that care. And uh, two thirds of people aren't lucky enough to even see endocrinologists. They see primary care providers. And frankly, all the data says they don't do well. Um, so uh, we're trying to change that. We're trying to solve the problem of uh, how the patient uses it, how they can actually make it a part of their lives and make that easy uh, to actually make clinicians down to the level of the primary care provider be able to prescribe and support something that actually is going to tune itself because it's smart to understand what it can do with the data. And then all this stuff has to pay for itself or else payers won't uh, uh, provide access to it. So you actually have to tie it through to things like emergency room visits for insulin dosing errors and actually do things like value-based healthcare going at risk to prevent those. But the good news is that technologies exist that can do that, and uh, I'm happy to be partnered with some of the smartest people I ever met, some of the most mission-driven people I ever met at Bigfoot in order to try and bring that across the finish line. Thank you. Thank you. Lots to talk about there. Very quick anecdote about the name Bigfoot. The, the, the first engineer, he, the story he was describing was he was still un, very uh, under the radar. No one knew who this individual was, so they started saying it was a Bigfoot sighting. So that's where the name came from. <laughs> and we got to, we had the privilege of actually publishing the sort of guest post that outed him. Uh, that and, right? Yes, you know actually that. a diabetes yeah. mind. Yeah. So yeah. That, there you go. That's the name Bigfoot. So wow, a lot to talk about here. Um, I think I'm going to start with CGM, which I mentioned being at the core of all of these changes. I mean, as when, when continuous monitors came out, it, it was being likened to if you only had a still camera and then suddenly you saw a movie for the first time, you would be falling over, wow, this is unbelievable. And, you know, for those of us who, um, you know, who live with this and you never had a sense of which way you were going, it was just you get a number and you get another number. So nothing, there was nothing to connect the dots. So really, um, I want to start with, with Joel, who's obviously uh, been in uh, behind this innovation and talk about a little bit about why CGM is such a game changer and why in particular um, the Abbott Lieber sensor has done so well when it's not actually a full-fledged CGM. So um, to explain, for those of you who don't know, a full CGM can just continuously takes readings whereas the Abbott needs to be scanned so therefore if you are sleeping at night it doesn't it's not going to take readings and it doesn't currently have um, alerts and alarms and yet people are kind of going crazy for it um, especially in Europe it's incredibly popular so can you talk to a little bit about that sure so I mean the the fundamental unmet need that that sort of triggered all this revolves around two things. One was just the sort of obvious observation that people weren't testing as frequently as they should when they were relying on traditional test strips because it's a daily painful reminder that you're living with a chronic condition. So it's, it's no mystery why many people just refuse to test as frequently as they should. And then the second was even for those that, that tested frequently, 
because traditional strips provide a discrete value that represents a moment in time, it provides no context about where you were or where you're going. So those two things in combination were the sort of the core problems that we were trying to solve. We were also sort of emerging from sort of the, uh, the phase of uh, CGM in its infancy, where as, as Amy describes, sort of the early forms of CGM were defined by the fact that uh, a sensor would operate autonomously, broadcast information to some receiving device that would make noises at you frequently. Uh, alarming you about some type of pending adverse event, or in many instances early on, uh, you know, the accuracy uh, wasn't what it is today, and so it would give you sort of false alarms. Uh, and, and for that reason, many early adopters uh, ended up rejecting it because it created what's known as alarm fatigue, is just you know, this, this nuisance that's, that's chirping in your ear all the time. Uh, the other big factor was cost. And so when we sat down to design Freestyle Libre, uh, really there was five guiding design principles that we declared early on and, and faithfully remained committed to throughout the entire process. Simplicity, convenience, discretion, actionable information, and affordability. And that last one uh, cannot be ignored because uh, it's that which has made it uh, a much more affordable option for now over a million people. Uh, the other thing that, that Amy mentioned is the fact that that sensor doesn't operate autonomously and that it's not broadcasting information without the user actually doing something. Now it's still pretty effortless. You take that handheld device, hold it near the sensor within say an inch or two and in a fraction of a second you get all this dense uh, glucose information, and, and while that may seem on its surface that it requires more out of the individual, it also restores a sense of control because that person can then test on their own terms when they want, where they want, in a fraction of a second without requiring much of them. Uh, and, and for many people, even though they may sacrifice through that uh, autonomous operation in the overnight period, during waking hours, it gives them the ability to do things on their own terms, which they, they highly value. All right. Well, I'm going to stick with you for a minute, um, Joel, because um, obviously we're here to talk about diabetes, but also innovation and the pathways. So it's a very interesting uh, case study that Abbott, as known as kind of a stodgy pharma company that actually came from you know, traditional finger stick meters, is ab was able to sort of transform itself and you know, put out this innovation that's really been quite disruptive. And I know you helped lead that charge, Joel. So can you talk a little bit about that? pathway? <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, Abbott has uh, a long history in, in healthcare innovation, 130 years or so, uh, and, and the diabetes division has a long history in glucose monitoring, sort of forged its, its uh, foundation on traditional strips and meters. And back in the 2009 time frame, we were sort of facing uh, an imminent crisis, and nothing motivates action uh, than something like that. And, and uh, we were sort of facing two pathways. One would have been sort of managing the business around strips and meters. And, and for those of you that follow the industry, you've seen the outcome of those that have remained focused on that. Companies like, you know, story companies like LifeScan, that was a J&J division, now sold off. Bayer, another big competitor in the, the traditional blood glucose monitoring space, sold off that division. So we were faces, facing that likely future or, thankfully, doing what we ended up deciding to do, which was doubling down on our core sensing technology, which at the time had been proven out through uh, an early product embodiment known as uh, Freestyle Navigator that was not commercially viable but certainly demonstrated to the clinical community the merits of sensing technology, specifically Abbott's wired uh, enzyme technology. Uh, so that was one motivating factor. And then there certainly was sort of the, the, the right chemistry and composition of the team. And for those of you that have been involved in any type of venture formation or startups or 
uh, sort of rogue teams within a larger organization. Uh, I credit sort of the chemistry and the composition of that team for a lot of the success of that program because in its early days, we had plenty of skeptics. And it wasn't, you know, it was through sort of becoming vocal evangelists for an idea that we deeply believed in and then remaining completely committed to a user-centered design process that allowed us to create something that now in retrospect we can say was transformative. But it wasn't always obvious as we were going through that process. Okay, I got one more core question for you, Joel. And that is, it's one thing to have a great sensor um, as a standalone product, but obviously now we're talking about combining these with systems. So um, can you talk a little bit about the work that's being done to integrate um, the Libre into these AID systems? Sure, and uh, I mean, the, the first step that we've taken uh, with that, well, really we should talk about the partnership between Abbott and, and Bigfoot, and it's not uh, a surprise that Jeffrey and I are both up on stage. Uh, we represent two facets uh, of sort of the ecosystem, but there's a lot of uh, like-minded philosophy and commitment to the user experience and, and doing right by the patient. Uh, that helped forge that partnership will be the exclusive provider in the US of the sensor component of the various systems that, that Bigfoot is producing. Uh, you know, beyond that, I think the other thing that's worth citing is sort of what I focused on the past two years, which is this fundamental shift from proprietary disconnected handheld devices like the reader that, that ships with the Freestyle Libre system to connected consumer electronics is the preferred primary user interface. Uh, and that opens up sort of a, uh, an entire ecosystem around it for many reasons. I mean, that device has a familiar user interface that now you know, billions of people uh, use on a daily basis for dozens if not hundreds of reasons. It's a, a, a common development platform. Uh, it's a powerful computing device that fits in your pocket. It's persistently connected to the internet. Uh, so for many reasons, that will become really the dominant form of the user interface to this uh, small disposable sensor that you wear on your body, which like all technology will become smaller, cheaper, faster, more accurate over time. Uh, and so that, that sort of fundamental shift will also enable greater convergence with a growing number of insulin delivery devices, uh, two of which Bigfoot is working on, sort of the, a, a smart pump, and Jeffrey, I'm sure we'll talk more about that, but also one that I'm personally very intrigued by, which is this emerging category of connected insulin pen. And that combination, sensor plus connected insulin pen plus uh, software-based dosing support residing on a phone, those three things will offer many of the known benefits of these more advanced automated insulin delivery devices at a fraction of a cost. So what Freestyle Libre does for sensing, that combination can do for AID systems. Great, thank you. So let's hear a little bit from Jeffrey about the systems you guys are putting together. And then for me, the question is always, as we're talking about moving into these connected systems that are modular, where patients would actually have choices of the pump unit, the, the sensor, and then the controller, you know, how does, how does that work in the real world? How does, how does that affect competition? So uh, we have decided to take uh, an approach like Apple. Uh, which is we're going to have a constrained ecosystem, and it's going to be simpler and more integrated and more usable by, by more people. Uh, there's a reason that my mother uses an iPhone and not a uh, Pixel 3 phone uh, sold by AT&T that's got three different apps for messaging, and she has to figure out which one is the one she uh, uses, and she has to figure out when to upgrade the firmware to be compatible with the app she wants. You don't have all that on Apple because a lot of the ecosystem has been standardized and controlled to make it easier for you to use. That's our approach. And so what we've got done is gone out and uh, for the components that exist, we picked what we believe are the best of breed. And we believe that the CGM from uh, Abbott, the Freestyle Libre, is the most easy to use uh, by the most people and will provide the safest and most robust and most easily trainable user experience for both people taking shots and people who are using insulin infusion pumps. Uh, these are the two uh, major baskets of products that we'll have. Uh, we're using the data 
We are a data science company fundamentally. We're taking data, data from the CGM, uh, data uh, that we gather from the smartphone, from the environment that we sense, and we're using that data to get smart about how insulin is dosed. Um, I think of our smart pens as CGM without numbers, because we can just tell you how much to take of the insulin. Uh, that is a math problem that has a solution, and we're embedding that solution in the devices themselves. Uh, most people, uh, can't do change at the supermarket in their heads. And yet we give them uh, these sliding scales and, and directions not to stack insulin within three hours. You need to understand that uh, a carbohydrate with a high glycemic index is uh, going to translate into blood sugar uh, much more rapidly than one with a low glycemic index. The insulin that you give doesn't actually start working for 20 minutes. Uh, it peaks in about an hour and then has a tail of three to five hours. And then also this uh, glucose uh, uh, that you're measuring is actually the interstitial fluid, not the blood glucose itself, and there can be a differential between the two, a gradient when they're both rapidly changing. So if you get all that, uh, you can take the CGM data and really tune in how much insulin you should be taking. Uh, and there are people who do that and they get all that, and it's a fraction of the population uh, that can do that or wants to do that. And so we believe by making it simple, taking away knobs and switches, uh, taking data away and giving people actionable insights, if not uh, the direction of how much insulin to take, is the way the problem should be solved. And uh, that, that uh, builds upon usability, a focus on what real people are gonna do every day. You know, people ask, you know, what's the best diet? And my answer is the diet you will do. <laughs> um, uh, the, the exercise regimen you will do, you know, because everybody's got the uh, optimal, but then not everybody's going to do the optimal. So if you can walk for 20 minutes a day, then that's the best for you if that's what you'll do consistently. Um, diabetes is like that. Some people are going to be uh, edge cases in terms of their desire to consume data, their analytical skills, their personalities uh, are going to engage with this disease and conquer it and, you know, try and uh, actually narrow down the ranges of blood glucose and those folks. Uh, spend a lot of time doing that. Most people will not do that. Most people can't do that. I have the perspective uh, of my son, because when he was in the home, I did that for him. <laughs> I was the obsessed uh, parent who was uh, tracking all the variables and had the spreadsheets. This was before the artificial pancreas systems and was optimizing all the different underlying variables. And then he grew up. And he doesn't want to do that stuff for himself. He's making a different choice for himself. Diabetes is not going to have that footprint on his life. He's not going to give it that much. He's not going to spend that much time on CGM alarms. He's not going to spend that much time on devices that are flaky and are stigmatizing, and he has to pull out to actually uh, out himself uh, to his colleagues at work. Uh, it, he has a different idea of what he'll do, uh, which I think is more like what most people will do. Because people with chronic disease are just like us. The, 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 their health is probably fourth or fifth down the list of things they think about. You know, I'm going to work, I'm worried about home, I've got hobbies, and then I'm going to the gym if I can. It's the same thing for people with diabetes. They got a lot of priorities in life and they want to actually live their lives. Um, we're gonna try and help the tools fit gracefully in their lives. It's a very different approach than has historically been taken. It starts from a very different place. And so we're partners with Abbott to bring it back uh, because I think we view the problem similarly that we're trying to solve. And then to answer your question, for people who want to choose their own sensor, want to choose their own pump, and want to choose their own algorithm, they're not a Bigfoot customer. Um, uh, we people to serve uh -huh. that need. Uh, we're focused on uh, simple, simple, simple. Okay. Well, you also hit on, touched on something I think is really important, that we're moving away completely from dumb devices. So for those of you who are not familiar, when we talk about smart pens, that basically means an insulin pen, which is a very convenient way to get to take an injection, um, no longer just sits there, but it now has these data capabilities where it can track what, you know, when you've had your last dose and you can share that data. It's so important. But not, again, not everybody wants to be a data engineer, but you do want to be able to have that information. And even the inhalable insulin that I talked about earlier, um, that company is also working on a tracker that would um, allow you to see when you took your last dose, how much, and to share that data with another system. So I would think we're really moving towards everything being digital, data-driven, diabetes care. 
Um, but so, I, other question. Um, I know that um, a number of companies working on these connected systems are putting the smarts in different places. Some, in some cases, it's uh, residing on the insulin pump. In a lot of cases, it's um, on the controller, which is the, the phone. So is that going to be a big differentiator? And then the other question, of course, is as you know, smartphone technology is ever changing, so is there concern there that there's going to be a disconnect between this, uh, the phone device and the medical functionality? Well, our uh, view, uh, which uh, uh, argues against plug and play, is that the devices actually have to be designed to work with the phone. They have to have a certain native intelligence themselves to accommodate when the phone isn't available. Uh, when uh, it is out of power, uh, when I left it at home, when my daughter has inexplicably, inexplicably dropped it in the toilet three times, you know, it's like it, the phone is just not going to be there sometime. And so if you're all dependent for your dosing information or for your algorithm that's telling your pump what to do on the phone, you're going to be frustrated a lot and you're going to be dealing with a lot of transitions between open loop mode and closed loop mode. We think that you have to build in the pump itself the ability to be smart and independent, uh, even if the phone's not there, and that the phone is kind of a, a partner to, to the pump. Uh, we, we think that things need to be designed holistically uh, for all the use cases uh, that are going to be uh, a company, are going to be encountered in daily life. Uh, daily life is messy, machines break, things get separated, people get distracted, um, uh, and yet it still has to work. And we think that if you actually wrap all that together and make it one thing, that you have a better chance of living more gracefully with more people. Interoperability is great, and it will, in the back end, actually help innovation so that we can use the next generation of the Libre sensor sooner. We can actually uh, be able to le leverage the best of breed of different components that are made by other companies from a regulatory perspective. But we, we believe that the whole system uh, is the focus of the design for us. All right. Well, you, you mentioned regulatory, and that's where I was going next. Yep. Obviously, a big challenge for FDA to deal with these systems that are made up of components from different manufacturers yep. and that have this sort of um, digital component to it that is still new and has a lot of inherent risk. So I know you've worked closely with them. FDA has actually been quite assertive, aggressive recently about um, trying to lay out this pathway. They just announced a new kind of eye pump designation, which is basically an interoperable insulin pump. Um, but can you talk a little bit about that and the work that FDA has done and where that's taking us? Yeah, the, they're trying to uh, make it simpler to, to swap in new generations of components and systems. So uh, they downgraded the uh, CGMs uh, to a uh, class two medical device, which is going to allow those to more rapidly iterate. And if I'm changing a class two device as part of my class three system, uh, which is a higher level of risk, uh, then uh, I can do that more uh, quickly with less paperwork and less waiting for yes from the FDA. Uh, same thing goes for an insulin pump. As insulin pump technologies evolve, these are not where uh, uh, the, the real focus of the FDA's efforts are in terms of evaluating safety. Right now, it's the algorithms. The right. sensors are well characterized. A pump is a pump. It's what do you do with uh, the data from that sensor and, and how are you dosing insulin based on that. So that will, I, I think, for uh, uh, any time frame I can see, be a class three medical device that requires a clinical trial. And, and frankly, I would object if it didn't because I don't know how you can put something on a person whose life will literally be dependent upon it uh, without testing it on people quite extensively. So are you saying the real competition will be between these different algorithms? No, I, I think the, the, uh, the real competition is uh, who can make a system that most people can use. I think you can actually do uh, uh, a lot of things with different algorithms, with different pumps, with different sensors. I think that the actual genius is in the digestibility of the whole thing as a solution. Uh, down to uh, the level of the prescription. that Because right now, a, uh, the one automated insulin delivery system that's on the market, the Medtronic 670G, is not one thing. It's eight different prescriptions. L literally for the pump, for the uh, reservoir that holds the insulin, uh, for the infusion set that uh, infuses the insulin, for the sensor, for the transmitter, for the blood glucose meter, which talks to the thing in order to get data out to provide to a clinician, the test strips for that blood glucose meter, down to the lancet that you prick your finger with, is literally a separate prescription. 
Uh, it's crazy. Uh, our view is it needs to be one prescription because it needs to be one thing that works with a bunch of pieces that have been designed and actually packaged for you for your easy digestibility, your easy uh, fulfillment every month. One prescription, it just comes every month, all the pieces. And so you would know from experience, yeah. that's part of the burden. Oh, absolutely, that, yeah. That's a big part of the burden, is just getting yeah. the stuff and, and coordinating this uh, symphony of all these different device components, consumable and durable. And so uh, systems thinking also uh, goes to the packaging. So that if all this stuff came to you in your home, down to the alcohol swab you're gonna to use to actually prepare your skin where the sensor goes on, all the training is done in the same style, covering all the components. You're not going to one company for training here, one company there. The uh, clinician doesn't have to go to one portal here and another portal here, each of which has partial data on what the devices provide. So th that's why we think that the systems are gonna be more digestible because they're just gonna require less training, less parts, and less uh, uh, ability to make mistakes. Yeah, and I can see from the way you talk about it, that this, you're coming from this personal perspective, from this, you know, the DIY hacking community. I wanted to ask you about that. Yep. Um, creating an organization out of people who were basically counterculture again. And the interesting thing is sort of, you know, the David and Goliath thing we've got going here, a very big, large, uh, established legacy pharma company working with um, this startup that is really made up of the people who were um, basically the we are not waiting crowd. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that organ yeah. how you We didn't really lean on the hacking thing when we were trying to get a partnership <laughs> with them. Um, but, uh, you know, these are what you call white hat hackers. You know, they're hackers for good. They weren't trying to do mischief. They were actually trying to help their families or themselves and improve their own medical devices and, and successfully so. Um, uh, those folks, uh, they understand uh, the problem that we're solving really intimately and, and uh, they understand the tools and how they break and how they don't serve uh, people today. And they understand things like security. So if you want to actually build a secure system, you hire a hacker because a hacker knows how uh, you sure. can actually exploit uh, security holes. Security is going to be a big thing because uh, uh, when you're connecting everything to the smartphone, that opens it up to the entire world, and all these medical devices weren't actually uh, developed in a world of Internet of Things. They, they were uh, developed in a world where if you held it in your hand, it was safe and secure. But now that everything's connected to everything, that is a very different thing and requires, again, some systems thinking in terms of how you can secure all those parts. And, and if they ever are hacked, how you can fix them quickly, like an over-the-air firmware update, all the consumer electronic innovations that we use so successfully and improve our lives, bringing those to medical devices is what we're trying to do. All right, I want to move to um, Dipya and ask about patient choice. I mean, we, we're talking so much about how things need to be patient-friendly and well-designed, but we're also talking about all these barriers and um, you know, the question is how aware are people of all of these choices and you know, what kind of um, dynamic are you seeing in the patient community in terms of ma making choices around the devices people use? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so I can start with CGM. Um, market estimates tell us that about 27% of people who are living with type 1 are on a CGM, which means that over 70% aren't. Um, so that's purely adoption. Um, in terms of awareness, uh, Beyond Type 1 just recently published a study where they showed that 34% of people with Type 1 in a pretty privileged patient pool actually had never heard of CGM or barely knew anything about it, which is pretty remarkable. Um, I think often when we're in this silo, it's hard to think broadly um, at the bigger patient picture. Um, with hybrid closed loop systems, our sister organization who does a lot of market research um, surveyed this group of people asking about interest in hybrid closed loop system if cost wasn't an issue and a shocking like 75% said yes I would want that if cost wasn't an issue um, which comes back to something we talked about where I think the biggest barrier to adoption is purely cost and um, how do we start designing solutions that um, are affordable um, and can reach a large you know patient audience um, in terms of patient choice with all of these dis different systems, I think it is overwhelming, but um, there are amazing companies doing great things that are helping making it more digestible for patients. Um, I think also pa doctors need to be, there's a lot of clinical inertia that we need to bypass. Um, about 30% of doctors don't talk to their patients about diabetes technology in the clinic room. 
Um, so how do we bypass that therapeutic inertia as well as you know, address the cost issues? All right. Thank you. I want to make sure we get to Eugene to talk to a little bit about what's going on at Biosite. So um, I understand you have diff three different flavors of your therapies, um, one specific to very high risk patients and the other sort of for everyone else with diabetes. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So thank you. Uh, I just want to, uh, all this discussion about blood glucose monitors and continuous glucose monitors pose a simple question, which is what's the best blood glucose monitor in the world? Well, it's a rhetorical question because it's the beta cell in the islet. So we feel like these cells have gone through hundreds of millions of years, or millions of years anyway, of learning how to sense blood glucose and when to deliver insulin. So our feeling is, now that we can make these cells, if we can get, get them wired into the circulatory system, and that's the key, that's the part about the three different products that we can potentially, because it's an endocrine system, Getting wired into the circulatory system is the key that we can have an effective product. So we go back to the islet transplant. Uh, the islet transplant I mentioned was limited by supply of cells, uh, immunosuppression or addressing the immune system in some way. Uh, a couple other issues include the delivery method. So currently islets are put into the liver portal vein, uh, which is a little bit of an invasive procedure. And uh, the last one would be cost. So, costs of islet transplants can be in the upwards of $100,000 or more if you add all the parts of that together. <clears throat> so we believe that we can address each of these with our product. So in terms of cost, we know that the cost of goods is reasonable for what we're working on. I think it'll be reimbursable. That's not an issue for, for the Viasite products uh, as far as we can tell. Um, in terms of delivery, we're putting these into delivery devices that go under the skin. It's essentially an, an outpatient procedure right now. Uh, patients should be able to do this under local anesthesia. Um, uh, 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 incision is made and, and the device is placed under the skin and then it's sewed up and, and essentially patients are, are back out um, the same day. Uh, in terms of the supply, I already mentioned embryonic stem cells or pluripotent stem cells. We can make as many of these cells as we want. And so that brings us to the last issue, which is the immune system. So with our different products, we're essentially delivering the same cells, which is these pancreatic progenitor cells that we've shown, uh, after implantation, further differentiate into bona fide human islet tissue. So these are, are islets in as much as they contain a vast, a large percentage of beta cells. They also contain alpha cells, delta cells, and the other cells of the endocrine islet. And we've shown in animals that these cells will actually lower an animal's uh, blood glucose set point to the human set point. So that's pretty interesting. So we can both cure an SDZ animal, but also putting it into a normal mouse that has a set point around 150, it will gradually bring the mouse's uh, set point down to the human set point around 100. So that's pretty cool. Uh, <clears throat> so we now have, uh, as you mentioned, um, two products in the clinical trial. So the most basic one is to simply solve this supply issue and uh, basically deliver an analogous product to an islet transplant, meaning the way we deal with the immune system is with pharmacology. So these patients that are currently being implanted in this phase one, two trial, are, are having to take immune suppression, and that's, that's the way that we address the immune system in that way. And we're starting to see that that's, that's actually an effective way to protect the cells as we showed, as has been shown with the islet transplants for many years. The second iteration is uh, actually was technically introduced into the clinic first, because if we could solve two problems at once, then that's you know, how we, that would be a, a better way to go about this if we could do that. Um, we ran into some issues and started to work through those, and we've been working on that in the meantime. But in this case, the product known as PEC INCAP, so the first one is the PEC Direct, meaning it's directly vascularized, like an islet transplant. The immune system is, is uh, sort of suppressed pharmacologically. With PEC NCAP, these cells are now encapsulated. So we think of this as a kind of a tea bag, if you will, uh, from a lay perspective. So we put the cells inside this tea bag. It has a, semi-permeable membrane, and in that way, the cells inside can survive and thrive 
because they have access from the blood, the, the blood supply on the outside of the tea bag or the Encaptra device, they have access to oxygen and nutrients and glucose, importantly, and reciprocating, they can now release their hormones, uh, insulin and glucagon and so forth, back out into the, into the um, circulatory system. So that's the second product, and we've had uh, a number of patients have been implanted with that, and we learned a lot about that. We've had to do this in a sort of a clinical research mode, so it's not a standard clinical trial where you say, okay, 30 people get this, 30 people get that, uh, check them you know, six months later and see what happened. In this case, we have to test in a few people, see how it's going. We have a Sentinel program that we use, which allows us to put small devices in and take them out periodically to understand what's going on in the larger devices that the patients are implanted with. So uh, with, with the, the VCL1 product, uh, or the PEC NCAP product, we've now had a number of patients implanted, as I just mentioned, and we're, we're working on that product in animals again because we ran into issues with the body's reaction to the, to the units, which was specific to, to the device, and we have the good fortune to work with Gore. So WL Gore and Associates, is the company that we're all familiar with makes Gore-Tex, which is our raincoats and our tents and, and these you know, camping gear and things like that. Well, what most people don't know and I didn't know is that half of Gore's business is actually implantable medical devices. So the material that Gore works with that, that is Gore-Tex is also the material that we use for this uh, semi-permeable membrane. So Gore is the world's wizards, as you can imagine, of this material and by working with Gore now, we've got different membranes with the same material, but in different configurations, and we're starting to see some real positive results with that in animals, and hope that we will soon be able to go back into the clinic with the PEC and CAP product. Because that product, as you mentioned, the first product requiring immunosuppression, not unlike people who are candidates for islet transplant, uh, we're, we're uh, bringing people into that trial who are at the highest risk, so that they're so severely affected with their diabetes. They're brittle diabetics, they have severe hypoglycemic episodes, they have hypoglycemia unawareness, they may have uh, extreme glycemic lability. So this type of patient is a candidate for the, for the PEC Direct trial that's, that's enrolling currently. Uh, if we are able to get the PEC and CAP, product going, then that would be one that would be usable for all with type 1 and insulin requiring type 2 patients as well for that matter. Uh, so the last one, which we view as sort of the next generation, should, should we continue to iterate on these, is a product where we can get the benefits of direct vascularization because there are challenges with this sort of teabag approach where cells are behind the, the membrane. We can get the benefits of direct vascularization but not require immunosuppression pharmacologically. So this is a, a system we're calling it PEC-QT, or VCTX210. Uh, and VCTX210 is a collaboration with CRISPR Therapeutics, or PEC-QT is a collaboration with CRISPR Therapeutics. CRISPR is a company that you likely know uh, is able to manipulate the genes and the genome uh, in very precise ways uh, very intentionally, and in that way make s very specific modifications to the genome. So you can, if you can imagine an entire encyclopedia of words, they can go in and find one word in that encyclopedia, change a couple letters, and then the whole encyclopedia is the same. So this is a way that we can now target the molecules that are involved in immune presentation. So there's a whole lot of science. Immunology is an amazing field. It's amazingly complicated. But we know that there are specific proteins that are involved in presenting and are, and are key players in allo rejection and autoimmunity. So if we can go into the stem cell line using CRISPR technology, CRISPR-Cas9, and manipulate those genes so that those proteins are no longer expressed or they're expressed in a different way, now we can create an immune evasive islet cell transplant therapy. So this is our big idea that's the next generation of how we're gonna do this. Um, we're working with CRISPR as we speak. The, the CRISPR people are fantastic. The Gore people are fantastic. We, we feel very privileged and fortunate that we can work with these uh, amazing companies and the amazing scientists and people that are in those companies. Um, so, so with this, uh, 
PEC QT product, we feel like we will have something that, that people can be implanted with and they don't have to take uh, pharmacological immunosuppression and it'll be a very robust implant. That's really exciting. So where are you exactly with this um, product with, so, that does not need immunosuppression? So the PEC-QT or uh, CRISPR Therapeutics collaboration has yeah. uh, just gotten launched in, in 2018. We're in animal studies right now. We're developing the different cell lines that will have the immunovasive uh, changes to them. And, um, you know, hopefully, uh, we, can't, we can't see a timeline on it, but hopefully in the coming years we'll be getting back into the clinic with that product. Okay, and final question there, you mentioned um, reimbursement not being an issue, that, that was making it sound like it's going to be really easy for this to be reimbursed for people, which is, sounds too good to be true, so can right. you elaborate a little bit on that? Right, so <laughs> you know, I understand that that, that would be uh, um, something people might be doubtful of or cynical of, but, but I know what the cost of goods are, I, I know what the, it's not, it's not ridiculous, we know what the procedure looks like, it's not ridiculous. And um, frankly, if, if, if something means that you no longer have to take insulin and you no longer need to check your blood sugar and it, by the way, makes all the chronic issues, all those sort of um, uh, unfortunate long-term effects of diabetes such as, uh, you know, people know the kidney problems, nerve problems, uh, vision, uh, heart problems, uh, vasculature problems, people having um, amputations and so forth. If you can make all that go away, now that's difficult to show in a clinical trial because it's a long-term effect, but we know from, for example, DCCT trial that if you can keep your blood sugar in a, in a, in a tight, tighter range, that that's one of the benefits. Um, uh, I feel like, you know, we, we haven't gotten to that point in product development, so I, I can't make well, any so promises. It's a really but, strong value proposition, just going to take a long time to get that data, right? Yeah, it's just yeah. going to, well, the, the long-term effects is going to take a long time, but I think even with the acute benefits of this product, I think it's, it's a very uh, insurable or reimbursable product. Um, let's hope so. <laughs> All right, so barring being able to get new cells, um, you know, let's talk about measuring success. Let's talk about how patients measure success. Um, when they're on different therapies, and Divya, I wanted to throw that one to you. Um, you know, how, uh, how are, first of all, we need to gather this data to, to feed it back to the insurers so that they will be obviously incentivized to cover these things, but at the same time, there's a growing attention to what patients consider success on you know, different therapies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's a movement right now called Beyond A1C, um, and A1C is a metric that we use to essentially um, measure average blood sugar over a long period of time. Um, and for a long time, that's been like the standard of care. Um, but now there's this movement to look at things like time and range, right? So for example, if you have someone who has an A1C of 7.0, that might be an average over the last three months, but someone who has had like say 120 blood sugar for the last three months, might have the same A1C as someone who's been fluctuating between a really high and a really big low. Um, so moving beyond the A1C, we're looking at things like time and range, and that's something that CGMs are really good at helping us get some insight on. And the reason time and range is so important is because those fluctuations feel like a roller coaster when you're someone living with diabetes, and that's something that affects your diet, your exercise, your sleep, your mindset. And um, at Diatribe, we have an article that is called 42 Factors That Affect Blood Sugar um, to really show people that they're not, you know, it's not one thing that's affecting their blood sugar. They are not necessarily in control of what's going on. Um, and a metric of success doesn't just have to be the number. Um, the only bad one maybe is that the one that you don't know, and I think that's where a CGM can play a really powerful, powerful role. Okay, um, so thank you all for your questions. I'm gonna try to address some of these questions from the audience that came in. I think this is probably for um, Joel and Jeffrey. How is patient data treated? Um, is data automatically shared with patients and doctors? I can talk about uh, what we do today. So, uh, I mean, first and foremost, we, we certainly take data privacy and security very seriously and abide by all of the established and emerging regulations around patient data privacy. Um, 
you know, with the, the sort of connected system that I described earlier where the mobile app is used as the primary user interface, that data gets instantly and automatically uploaded to a cloud-based service that then uh, is used by clinicians and patients to generate a series of reports that uh, expose insights around their trends and patterns and are used to make faster, more informed treatment decisions. Uh, the data is owned by the patient, uh, but we enable them to share that data with people of their choosing. So typically that's their clinician, but there's also a, a second mobile app that we make available to, that's designed for use by caregivers uh, that, you know, for in the use case where uh, a parent wants to remotely monitor the scan activity of their loved one, you know, their child, uh, they can do that on their phone and see if and when they scan their sensor and what the result was so that if there's some type of pending adverse event, they can intervene from a distance. Uh, but that's all controlled by the patient themselves. I don't know if that's... I think, well, I think what they're question. also trying to get at is, like, is the, does your doctor automatically see your CGM, yeah. have access to your yeah. CGM data so that they can work with you in, in, in interpreting it and make use of it? Yeah. Well, so our, our approach is very patient-centered. Uh, your data will only go uh, where you want it to go. It's on a permission basis, and you can revoke that permission. Uh, that uh, could be your doctor. It could be uh, your... Uh, loved one, uh, and it's not just data or not, it's uh, different levels of abstraction of the data. So let me give you an example. These connected systems, uh, uh, you know, if you have a kid, you want to see everything that's going on and you want to be able to know they're safe and then also uh, help them uh, to live successfully with the disease. However, if you have a spouse, um, I might want to share some data, uh, which is, I want you to know if I'm in trouble. I want you to know if I'm having a low blood sugar and I need help, uh, uh, but I don't want you to see every time I ate something that I shouldn't have eaten and I want to, <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's just for me, I'll make decisions for myself. So uh, we cut the data, you know, such that if you want to give uh, actionable insights to a loved one so they can help you on your terms, fine. If you want to share the full data, yes, but, you know, uh, sharing data is a, uh, it's an art, you know, and you have to create some protocols around it in order to do it well, I think. Um, one of the things that's actually not so good about all this data availability, uh, you can have it for your kid, but it also gives you the opportunity to harass your kid to no end for yeah. you know, not being perfect. Uh, and I will admit to, uh, as the data was coming online and I was downloading meters and stuff, I was pushing too hard to try and help him, and the data was actually just feeding the habit of knowing everything that he did wrong that he, he could have done better. Um, we, uh, we need to learn how to uh, live with the data and to help people live with the data and, and not feed into you know, the instincts that are going to cause conflict and tension and parents and, and kids or spouses. Uh, there's so a lot what about to learn. doctor access, though, to, to the data? It's opt-in. I mean, my, opt -in. My, okay. if I give it to my doctor, the doctor can have it. And if I don't want my doctor to have it, it's my data. Um, uh, I, we feel strongly about that. But I should say, the remote monitoring part of it is also hugely life-changing for adults. So my colleague, who actually is in Michigan, we have these regular calls, and he's had diabetes since he was five, and occasionally he just wouldn't answer. I thought, well, that's good. I'd have to call his wife at the bank, and she would rush over there, and she'd find him passed out. Yeah. You know, and now ever since we have CGM, she follows his data, and she can see when he's going low and actually intervene. So it's a huge life changer on that level as well. Um, okay, we have another question for you, Jeffrey, actually. Um, what is the biggest technical impediment to bring, make, making these artificial pancreas closed-loop systems mainstream? The, the biggest technical impediment is you have to deal with a lot of different technologies. And so small companies, startups that usually drive innovation, they have to spread across so many different things. Uh, uh, medical uh, device hardware and the embedded software in those devices and apps on smartphones and cloud systems and cybersecurity that covers all of these things. Plus, you have to be able to do manufacturing of these devices under the constraints of the FDA and, and keep a quality system which documents everything under the sun that you ever do at the company. And then you have to be able to interface with the FDA with reams of uh, documents and be able to do clinical trials. And, and all of that together is a lot of stuff. 
So the main impediment to innovation is that only big companies can do it, and big companies don't know how to do innovation. And so it's only reached the tipping point now. This is why it's good. I'm sorry, I'm a small company together. guy. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, no, I'm sorry, Abbott did great innovation. Abbott, they were, uh, them, them. Um, they, actually, they are the rare case of a big company that literally did an innovative thing that is as innovative as any startup. Uh, but they had a particular uh, situation, as he said. They were desperate. They had to in order to basically save the business. <laughs> That's like a startup where well, you're going to run out of money. There have been a number of companies that are going out of the diabetes business, yeah. and there have been pumps that have been pulled from market because um, they couldn't make it in this new world, and they weren't innovating fast enough, and they weren't uh, they didn't prioritize the, the digital side of things. So yeah, it's uh, it's getting to be pretty pretty uh, cutthroat. <laughs> Um, okay, so for Viasite, there are a number of questions here I'm not even going to bother you with about how soon is this going to be out, when is it coming, when is it coming. But we also have the question, <laughs> will the Viasite solution benefit type 2 diabetes? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so when is it coming? Of course, I can't answer the question. I want to know the, question, the answer to the question myself, so we're working on it. And, and you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, we've been working on this for more or less 18 years. If you go back to the, to the previous iterations of this company, uh, we had a merger of three companies in 2004, uh, which then became Novacell and then the present day Viasite. And uh, it's been a long road, but I, I, what I find so interesting is that we were urgent all along the way. There was no point where we were like, well, let's just sit around and see how this goes. It was every time there was something new coming and oh man, now we have to solve this. We spent a long time figuring out how to make pluripotent stem cells into, into pancreas. And then the next thing was delivery devices. So now we hired a whole, a whole uh, group of engineers to come into the company. People say, well, why didn't you have somebody else do the devices? Well, we needed to have control over that. At, at that very early stage of product development, you need to know what's going on with the manufacturer and the design of the devices and take charge of that ourselves. So that was a conscious decision. And the other third part of this, we have a manufacturing stream for cells, we have a manufacturing stream for devices, and the third manufacturing stream is putting these things together, which sounds very straightforward, but actually getting the cells in the device, sealing it up, getting in media, putting it in a package, and putting it all and sending it to the point of service is all another project in itself. So it's been a long road. Um, I did want to mention a couple things in terms of how this company has come to be, which is we had some, some venture funding to start with in the early 2000s, and that was going well. But this project takes a long time, and we were so fortunate to have the patient advocacy group, JDRF, there. And JDRF actually helped us. They funded the... the uh, generation of our first, of, of this pluripotent stem cell line that we use today. So this line is a GMP cell line. If you know what GMP means in terms of biotech, it's critical. And JDRF was there to support us. And about 10 years ago, the man on my right was one of our best friends because he was helping us as we move these products into the clinic and, and so forth. And so JDRF has been uh, an extremely valuable supporter, supporter of our of our project and our products all throughout this process, um, both financially as well as scientifically and as advocates for what we're doing. The other one I wanted to mention, and uh, I don't know if I'm answering the question here, but I'm just gonna say, say what I wanted to say, Go. which is that we're in California and there's a group called the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, also known as the State Stem Cell Agency. This is Proposition 71 in 2004 we voted, hopefully we all voted for the, the, the Prop 71, which then created the State Stem Cell Agency. The State Stem Cell Agency, by the way, was started large part by those who were advocating for type 1 diabetes. So families with type 1 and those who had heard, oh, stem cells are not gonna be supported by the federal government research? Well, we're gonna make a difference here in California and we're gonna support this promising product. And so Viasite naturally falling right into sort of the, the, um, the type of project that CIRM would want to fund, we have now been the recipient of more state funding than any other company. So, so uh, upwards of 70 or $80 million from the state. So the reason I mention this is because now, first of all, there's been amazing progress that's come out of our state stem cell agency 
And it's not just diabetes. We're one of like 50 different diseases that are benefiting from this CIRM money. And the reason I mention it now is because there's going to be another proposition coming up. And I want to, I want to make a, a plea to you all <laughs> to be advocates for this because it helps you, it helps us, it helps everybody who has a disease in their family or knows anyone with a disease. So okay. if that includes you, <laughs> don't just okay. vote, don't just just vote, vote for it. Advocate for it. That means tell everyone you know. That's That's a great note to end on. Thank you all so much. (laughs)